Hello everyone, well, it's Joe here from Living to Learn. Welcome back to the Living to Learn uh, creative studio. Um, I'm just here to talk a bit about a subject I've seen pop up in the forums a lot ever since Baton Gate. If those who don't know what that is, ask a, a, a Blade friend who's been in the game a while. It wasn't a, it wasn't a pretty time to be on the Blade forums. But a question that keeps coming up again and again in, in the forums is that uh, batoning. Good, bad or indifferent, it, it doesn't bother me. But I, I do see people reaching out sometimes for advice and they get shut down. All of a sudden people come out of the woodwork and say, oh, buy an axe, buy an axe, buy an axe. I mean, we know that an axe is a wood processing tool to a point. Now, I never like extremists in either end of the scale. I don't like when people um, batten knives to ridiculously stupid pieces of timber that are only meant for an axe. And I don't like when people use an axe to, to, to take stuff all the way down to matchstick level. I, I feel that it, a little bit in both camps and somewhere in the middle, one is safer, and two, it makes life easier. I mean, I've, I've seen videos of experienced woodsmen um, holding small bits of timber and trying to put an axe through the top of it. You know, you like even myself, I'm guilty of this. I when I first started, axe, 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 axe. I, I didn't have a knife that I, I trusted to baton with, and it was a sentimental knife. It was a present or from my father-in-law, so I didn't want to go whacking that through bits of timber. So I started off with the whole, hold the top, and just give the the axe a light tap, and then remove your hand. And then one day I was holding it, just giving it a light tap, and my axe just went straight through the timber. Damn near took my fingers off. So that's when I decided to get into batoning my smaller bits of kindling and, and venture down the knife road to buy one. Now there's various hurdles in and around that knife buying thing. But the, the thing I'm hoping this video answers is that question that gets asked and shut down. And personally I don't agree with that in any form. Because if a question is asked, regardless of how many people come along and say, buy this axe, buy an axe, get a chainsaw. The person is going to baton. I know from experience. If if this if the question is being asked by a person, they're going to do it anyway. And as people who have been there, I feel it's their responsibility to at least help whoever asks these questions, regardless of whether you agree with the practice or not. You you want to. We're all here to learn. Only for people guided me, I wouldn't know anything. Regardless of in this fashion, the friends here, there, YouTube videos here and there. So I'm hoping that. This video would at least answer some questions in regards to that what knife should I buy for wood processing question that isn't allowed to be aired in forums anymore. And if it makes me the Julian Assange of YouTube and batoning, that's that's it's fine by me. I just hope it helps out those people whose questions keep getting shut down on forums. So but when you should use a knife for wood processing is really up to yourself. But just don't be ridiculous about it. I'm going to show some kind of guidelines in regards to grinds and and use of knives in regards to this. And I have some examples <coughs> here behind me um, of different knives that I use for the task. So do, we'll just start off really quickly. Ta -da, look at this. <laughs> We're Gucci up in here today with the four knife grinds that are most commonly found in the woods by woodsmen. Or used in the woods by woodsmen. Yeah, if you find any knives in the woods like this, happy days. But the, the you have a Scandi, you have a full flat grind, you have a saber, and you have a convex. Your Scandi is the most commonly used one because of the way its geom its its geometry is in regards to wood processing. Your full flat grind and your saber is your spider coals and your BK sevens. There you have it. Here that'd be an example of a saber grind. High shoulders, taper down, and then you'd have a secondary edge. Here, sadly, I couldn't illustrate that well enough. And then you got your convex edge, which is your large sweep to a point. Now, out of all of these edges, your convex edge is your man. It's it's the strongest edge. You can get the keenest edge on it. But when it comes to working in the field, great on day hikes and stuff like that. This is predominantly what Bark River would use. They know their stuff over there. But this is predominantly Bark Rivers kind of stuff. And then, um. Your your common man area would be over here in your in your Scandi zone. Now the convex edge is the stronger one, but it's the hardest to maintain in the field. I personally, if I was going on a long trip, 
I wouldn't take a convex edge with me just in case I happen to hit a stone or my, I let my knife drop and stuff if I was to chip a convex edge. I personally would not have the skills or tools to repair it in the field. Scandy, a little more so, a little more easier to repair. So they're the four choices that most woodsmen use. I'm not saying either one is, is, is right or wrong, you know, depending on the budget. I'm trying to just help you choose if you're like, I'm not one of these people that would lord over price if all if if you've got fifty dollars, that fifty dollars could be like a thousand dollars to you and, and someone who has a thousand dollars might only be like fifty dollars to them. I'm just trying to help you narrow down your choices in your range. So when you go to look, you're looking at these four grinds, neither of which are are any worse than the other ones when it comes to wood processing. You just gotta look at your skills for, for maintenance. I predominantly go with Scandi, as you can see here. Scandi, Scandi, Scandi. It just it just works for me, and it, it, it's I find it easier to maintain. And the reason why here is because of the anatomy of the blade. Most Scandis would, of course, you have your tip. They generally, most of the time, generally have a flat spine up top, and they got a set of low shoulders. This is this is your key for batoning right here, the shoulder height of the blade. You can see here that the shoulder height of this one is low enough but still high then you got your plsk1 with really low shoulders goddamn wood grenade but the the scandy grind on it is not so steep and then you got your pks the, the atomic bomb of wood you got your steep grind and you got your low shoulders this thing blows wood apart like nobody's business it's, it's probably the best woods processing knife that I own from the Pathfinder knife shop. And that's why I genuinely run with this. The shoulders are very important. Now, with shoulders this low, you got to remember that you're going to lose some slicing capability. You know what I mean? You're not going to be... They do work. They'll feather stick. They'll, they'll make notches. But it's, it's no samurai sword you will lose slicing capability and that's another argument for another video i hope to do a follow-up video to this in regards to answering the top 10 most used questions in regards to batoning and forms but moving on when you go to baton this is the danger zone of when you go to baton the, when your tip is forced in contact with the wood this is more than likely when most damage is going to be done to your edge so you got to choose your wood very carefully wood choice here is very important like most people tend to blame a knife when the knife fails from batoning, but I don't. First thing I look at is the user and how he was using the knife. Now, I'm not saying all users are responsible for breaking their own knives, but it, eight times out of ten, that's usually the cause. So this here is when it's in the danger zone. So you, you want, when you're batoning, the least time to travel from driving this edge into the timber to your shoulders. The less distance here, the better. As you can see in the PKS. And this is why convex is so good. Well, actually, do I have my Sharpie with me? I'm going to talk to my drawings. Convex is so good because it is nothing but shoulder. As you can see, uh, this is a rough drawing of a convex edge that once uh, you got the first 0 0.5 millimeters of the blade into the timber, you're entering shoulder territory there. But this distance, you want to be minimal. But the smaller this distance gets, you're losing slicing capability. And the reason why you want that distance to be as small as possible is because once you drive the edge in, tap, tap, and it gets to the shoulders, the shoulders is what drives the woods apart. It's not the edge. It's the thickness of your blade and how quick the shoulders get into the timber. Because the minute the shoulders enter the timber, you end up with a empty space a cavity if you will in the timber in front of your edge so your edge is protected totally so once the shoulders are in your edge will very rarely connect with the timber again this is wood choice if your wood choice is, is free of knots because that's the the other problematic part is when you're you do come in contact with knots and this is the I, this happened to me once in sweden using my scrammer one, it was cold, so the temperature had affected the blade. And two, I came across knots in the wood 
like this and that is when your edge regardless of shoulders will come back into contact with timber again so you're you're better off trying your best to choose a piece of timber that has little to no knots in it and if it does have knots in it i found the best way to to counteract that is to turn the wood upside down and try and use as much distance between your blade and the knots as possible so because once these shoulders enter it genuinely splits so if all your knots are down the bottom of the wood when you go to baton once your shoulders get in there the wood will just divide and hopefully won't come in contact with any knots but this is just something to watch out for most of the time when an edge is damaged you look at the piece of timber and there's knots riddled throughout it and i mean the, it, 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 it's going to roll your edge depending on temperature and type of timber that it is now a general rule of thumb with batoning is half the size of your timber to the half the size of your blade so if you're carrying a six inch blade which is my preferred i prefer five to six inches if you're carrying a six inch blade like this three inches is what you want to be batoning most of the knives you see fail, I see the picture up in a forum where there was a picture of a like a 10 inch, 11 inch blade and it was it was a thin enough blade but a 10 inch convex ground blade being hammered to a frozen piece of, of what looked to be hickory. Now that's no good either because you're putting all the stress out the front of your blade. You've got to think mechanically, you've got to think engineering like where you're going to be putting pressure points and stress points. You want your timber to sit just about here and with a strong enough tip you don't want your timber to sit here and then have eight inches of tip sticking out this way because when you hit the timber all that stress is going here and you're going to shatter your blade it's the same with your grip when you grip your knife for batoning you don't want to be holding it dead tight you you can just hold it on the top of the top of the blade you know what i mean just sit it on the timber and hit and she'll split because when you grip this tight, you're creating a stress fracture here. And unbeknownst to yourself, you could roll your blade just slightly. So when you come down on it, this is where most blades break from batoning. And it's because people have been gripping it too hard. And when they come down on it, you're going to split it here. Just let it rest on the top of the wood and hit and let it do its business. And it should have no problem. So that's, that's another general rule of thumb here. This is when you see most knives break. is by poor wood choice and by pushing a knife way beyond the capabilities of what it's supposed to do. And when I carry a mower with me, I'll usually carry an ax because the ax can process it down to where the mower is capable of it. I mean, you're only working with maybe two inches of blade there to process kindling and finer duties. And it does it, and it does it well. But you're not going to be batoning. Like most mowers you see when they break, it'll be kind of up around the tip because people try and push it too far and they're only hitting that much of the blade when it goes into the wood and poor wood choice. It won't split, and it does happen, happens to all of us, happens to me, and they have to wail on just a small tip of blade. Now, your handle material is also another thing. If you're going to use a knife predominantly for woods processing and, and going through woods, I, I try and avoid timber. It, it looks beautiful, hell, I, I shock wood on, on most of my custom pieces, but if you have to strike the handle, it does have a tendency to crack. You want to go with your my characters, your G10s, your um, your polymer based handles, your plastic based handles for for easing. Now, once you have your wood choice and your grind, you know what I mean? Once you know your grind and where you're going to run with it and the length of your knife, you got to think of the spine of your knife. I have two examples here. And <laughs> there we go, the tracker. The tracker makes its way into every video. I personally don't like the tracker, but even the tracker, Tom Brown, the designer of the knife originally, only made this section of the knife for batoning. Nothing going on up here. Just this section of the knife and a little divot up here to wail into. The saw back, I don't know what it's there for, but the, I personally tend to avoid saw backs because it, it chews up batons. These knives are, this, this is the Goldilocks zone for batoning in the Tom Brown tracker. And even there, kind of, he goes with the rule of thumbs. The one I have on the bottom here is an example of the book Hoodlum or my artistic interpretation of the Book Hoodlum. The Book Hoodlum was a fantastic knife, or a knife made by Book, um, for a designer of knives who passed away. And it, 
I don't know what the intended purpose of this knife was because it kind of falls into an awful lot of mid-range categories lengthwise and, and stuff like that. But these knives fail a lot, a, a lot. And it's because people fall prey to this divot here. This divot here instantly makes this knife a non-wood processing knife for me because it introduces weak points in the blade like sawback knives do. But what you find most, if you go to Google, go to YouTube, type in book hoodlum fail, is that people stick to all the rules, pick a good piece of wood that's half the size of the blade, and they put it here. And this is why I use this knife as an example, as why I look at pictures when people have longer knives and, and smaller pieces of timber that they break, and they say batoning is a dangerous practice. No, people practice batoning dangerously. Batoning isn't a dangerous practice. So what happens here is that people choose the right length of timber for the blade, but then they start wailing on this much tip and it snaps here. It fails there almost every time. You know what I mean? So it's it's a prime example of where you need to compromise on length and have one solid piece of metal. The flatter up the top, the better. The flatter down here to the sweep, the better. So feel free to go look that up. There's, I'm not saying it's a bad blade. It's just people use it that's it was a design of purpose, but it's a prime example of... A, a long knife failing and they will fail you know for a for batonic and people ruining a good knife the book hoodlum is a, is a lovely looking knife now just some knife examples that i carry for wood processing and another kind of surefire method if you're going to process so you you're going to choose your grind preferably a grind with um low shoulders for splitting the timber now, if you're only going to be processing small kindling, and I'm even guilty of this, this is a knife that I, I personally had a hand in, in designing. I went with a high one on this because it's small. I personally wouldn't be batoning anything bigger than what I would baton with a mora with this because I'm only working with this much of edge before my sweep. But I use this on my day hikes. It's more of a carve or a notching type knife, a kind of a bushcrafty type blade. So I wanted this to have more slicing capability, i.e. weigh the edge. And the shoulders are up here because I'm only mainly batoning twigs and fine kindling with this beast. So there's there's my wood grenade there. If I'm going anywhere where I know I'm going to have to do some heavy duty wood processing, this is the the one for me with the low shoulders and the high sweep and the glance, the the shallow the shallow back there. This is the PKS. And the reason why I'm holding this one up is because I want to talk about the last thing, and that's knife makers who have the best warranties. Now, you've got to choose. I don't blame knife makers for not um, warranting blades that have been mistreated. You know what I mean? You, if you're an independent maker and you're making knives out your shed, you, you can't be warranting against stupid, as, as Mike Stewart from Back River would say. But get in touch. Most makers are semi-custom makers make knives specifically that they will stand over with regular use of batoning and don't try and f think you can fool knife makers in regards to that because they know what the difference is but the pks for example is the pathfinder knife shop and you can look at jamie burley's video of him demonstrating this and it is a, it is a wood grenade and it is purpose is designed for for it to be a one tool option i know it's a buzzword but it's designed to be a one tool option wood processing game processing kind of knife and they will stand over it feel free to go look at their warranty on self-reliance outfitters the other maker is is brenton good from quick Etch. his knives are absolutely fantastic i've ranted about them all the time you don't need me to tell you more i actually got a bit of a teen on this blade i got to look after i haven't had my knives out most of the winter so i have to apologize but he would stand over. He's a very good warranty policy and is always contactable and one of the very few independent makers. You see, this is where you've got to be careful now because the PKS is a semi-production one, like LT Wright Knives, like Bark River Knives. They're, they're larger companies who kind of semi-make custom knives, semi-produced, mass-produced knives. And they usually have the better warranties because they're bigger, they've overheads if you break one they can pull one off a shelf should they decide to refund you and send it back to you whereas independent makers like brenton and stuff they don't carry stock of continuous knives so you have to make sure you write to them and ask them 
what their warranty policy is. And most of them have have the better ones. Like, the, like say the the K Bar BK Seven, an indestructible knife doesn't need no introduction. Feel free to watch any reviews on it you want if you like it. This is one by Blake Watson. Um, if this breaks, K Bar will not refund you at all. So you, you got to start looking at at these things if you want insurances. Um, Battle Horse Knives. They are another great company. Their warranty is absolutely excellent. They market their blades as wood processing knives. They show you batoning in their videos and they, they will stand over any of their workmanship. Again, a semi-custom shop. They do do full custom knives, but for the most part, they're semi-custom. They have a 90 day turnaround. But if you break one of these, it's not like it, it would be a big deal for them to replace it and in fact I very rarely I actually I don't think I've ever seen one of these fail now all knives will fail but I personally I don't think I've seen any one of these fail again like I, I said at the, the start of the video a good way to look at a knife's reputation is to go to YouTube type in said knife's name put fail after it go to Google Images type in said knife's name and put fail after it because sometimes stuff doesn't make it onto YouTube and would be hidden in forums. So that's that's really the best information that I could give and the answer that I would like to give to people to who are looking at but finding a knife to baton with. I don't see the point in again shutting those people down. Just just help them out as best you can. I hope this video has helped help somebody out in regards to what they're choosing to do. I'm not going to get into Rockwell hardnesses and stuff like that. I'll save that for another video. I just wanted this one to be a nice quick, not quick enough, you know me, I ramble, a nice quick video on how to meander the huge sea of knives when you're looking for a knife to baton. So just a quick rundown. Choose your grind, preferably one with shoulders. The shoulders will affect the um, slicing capability. You're looking for six inches if you're going to be processing larger pieces of wood if you're talking whole branches you're looking for six inches if you're only going to be processing fine kindling and carrying an axe with you most of the time or a tomahawk with you most of the time four inches is fine you know the more sized blades are more than perfect enough you're looking for full tang you're looking for one solid piece of construction I always think of the book hoodlum model and and what to avoid one solid piece of construction try and avoid wooden handles they are nice but try and avoid them if you have to wail on them because generally from what i've seen in the forums they are the ones that break and and you should be fine only baton wood that's half the size of your blade wood choice is very important try and avoid knots time and time again you see these pictures and i'm also hoping for the experienced knife people out there that this video might just make you think a little that when you see a video or a picture of a broken knife and someone complaining about batoning or the act of batoning to look at the picture and, and have the and, and scrutinize it you know never take anyone's word don't even take my word for, for, for this stuff go out and practice it go out and try it but when you see pictures of stuff look at the timber choice look like I've seen a picture there um, uh, recently of, of a knife that failed and the, most of the knife was buried in, in the timber. It was a, It's a four and a half inch blade. And it was buried in like a five to six inch piece of timber. Now that was his fault. Not the knife's fault. It was his fault. And then of course he had to wail on the handle to try and get the knife out. The knife was a full tank knife but it had a wooden handle. And wailing on a wooden handle, it is going to break. You now people came out of the woodwork saying, oh, yeah. It failed. That was originally on blade forms, that one. And there was people say, regardless of whether the knife had a bad heat treat or not, or regardless of whether crystalline um, impurities in the metal caused uh, small fractures. At the end of the day, the dude buried the knife into a piece of hickory and had the whale on the handle. Any knife would, would, would give up. I don't care if, how good a maker you are. A knife would break having to, to deal with that. Uh, uh, other pictures you I seen, uh, like the one I was talking about earlier, where it was kind of like a, it was kind of like a competition knife, kind of like a competition cutter, you know what I mean? And it was um, broke. Now, where it broke was further beyond the piece of timber, like the book hoodlum problem. 
for to be on the piece of timber where a stress point because the blade was so goddamn long where it broke plus the wood was old and there was snow on the ground and i know from experience that when using a knife in in freezing temperatures you know you shouldn't be batoning with it anyway i've broken a knife personally doing that so just scrutinize these things and if anybody comes along looking for advice just be kind you know we can all just shout people down screaming axe 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 all day but the, the healthy discussion is the way forward regardless of whether you agree with it or not show out an opinion help people and i think we could get this done because i like a good discussion in a trade and i, I hate seeing trades being shut down um over over stupid stuff and then the, the person who asked the question could go off and, and end up hoarding themselves or breaking more beautiful knives and we don't need any more broken beautiful knives but i'm not going to rant anymore i'm going to go off and clean these knives up and sort it out um, and the patina is on them i'm disappointed in that but here thanks for listening to me rant and um, i hope to see us here on the living to learn channel again sometime we got some great giveaways coming up and um, loads of goodies and some announcements and um, go over and check us out on the living to learn community um facebook page where all this stuff is discussed freely and uh i'll see you next week cheers